So good morning, ladies. It's really fantastic to have you with me today. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. And it's really wonderful to be able to share such a fantastic topic with you, which is all about reducing the stress that we have as women on a daily basis and also about increasing our, essentially increasing our resilience. And the reason why I think that this is such a, an important topic really is because I think in many ways we as females live such very busy lives and sometimes I think it just gets the better of us. And so this particular webinar is about how we look at stress as individuals but also how we reduce our stress and what we need to do in increase our resilience so that we are able to deal with life a little bit more effectively. And I always like to start the webinars with questions like these, such as, so would you like to learn how to manage your stress well so you feel as if you're in control of everything? Would you like to not feel as if life is getting on top of you and you can't cope? Because so often, so many of the women with whom I work are in a situation where they've got so much on their plates, they're trying to do so many things for so many different people that I think at times we get very, very overwhelmed. And one of the problems around that is that the more overwhelmed we get, the less sometimes we feel as if we're in control of life. And the less we feel of control of life, often the more depressed we get, the more anxious we get, and the more upset we get. So it's really about getting rid of the anxiety you feel, making sure that the headaches you have don't have or don't occur anymore, and the ongoing feeling of walking uphill. And all of those things, the anxiety, the headaches, the overwhelm really are largely related to stress and how we A, perceive stress, but also how we deal with stress, which is equally as important. Would you like to be able to manage any situation at home or at work calmly so that you're able to get up and go through life in a much more kind of controlled and, I guess, composed manner so we feel less stressed and less out of control? And would you be able to stress less or be able to like to feel to stress less? Would you like to be able to feel more relaxed in everything you do? And I guess I always use the analogy of feeling like a wrung out chicken most of the time because I feel so many people in modern day life are running around like chickens and feeling really out of control of so many things. It's almost like I also use the other metaphor of human beings being like little ants running around and sort of bumping into each other and then continuing on their way. And I think modern day life is very much like that. And I think it can be absolutely exhausting. So welcome to this webinar today. My name is Taryn Walsh. Most of you know me, some of you don't. Um, I'm a psychologist. I work on three different countries. So I work in Africa, Australia and Fiji. And the work that I do is very much in leadership and team development and executive coaching. And also doing a lot of work with women, um, which is probably one of my other, my other passions besides leadership. So welcome to the webinar. Really lovely to have you with me. But maybe it's time when we talk about stress, and maybe it's time to look at how we deal with stress and whether we're able to deal with stress well. And also, you know, maybe it's time that we looked at how we live our lives and how we manage stress through fresh eyes. Sometimes I think we are just all on the merry-go-round of life or the treadmill. And often I think we found it very difficult to get off the treadmill because we're so used to being on the treadmill. And so maybe it's time to ask yourself, how do I handle my stress? Am I wound up generally? Do I react to life and things too easily? And notice I use the word react. I use it very deliberately as opposed to respond. I think very often we react to life. Often what we do is we just, when something happens, we just kind of, you know, react to it in the moment. So we go almost like our heckles get up and we just react in that moment in a way that may be aggressive or it might be frustrated, it might be irritable, or it might be that our way of reacting is to just completely withdraw from that situation or that person. And I don't always believe that by reacting to life that we live life most meaningfully. I think it's better to respond to life as opposed to react to life which is something that I'll talk about just a little bit down the track in this webinar. But I think it's really important to think about when things happen in life that are not good or you found, you know, wow, I really didn't, didn't think that that was fair or I think that that was inappropriate. I think when we do something in 
like reaction to that thing right immediately. I don't think that often it works for us. I think most often it works against us. So I'm going to talk to you about how to respond to life more effectively in this webinar and try and get you thinking about how you are in stress and how you do manage things that happen to you and are you a person or a woman who thinks in a resilient way or are you somebody who lets life get on top of you? Because those things are critical to the outcomes of how we live overall, how we manage our stress and how we perceive stress and also whether we are able to be resilient and bounce forward when, when life gives us a curveball. And maybe it's time to think about whether you're able to feel more in control and manage your life and the difficulties that occur. Because at the end of the day, we're all going to have difficulties. Life is not great all the time, unfortunately. And I think one of the key things about when life is not great, the great thing about when life is not great, is that it gives us the opportunity to look forward to when life does get better. You know, sometimes, whilst I would love it, where we're living in the most wonderful world and the most fantastic lives all the time, obviously that's not reality, but I think the downside sides of the times that make the upsides even better. I think the other thing to ask ourselves is do we manage our workload well? And obviously I'm talking about the paid work that you do. So if you go into an organization or even if you're in your own business, do you manage your workload well? Or do you let things get on top of you and do you stress about those things? Or even for example, at, you know, in the home, we do so much work at home as women that I think often we, we manage it very well, but sometimes it just gets on top of us and sometimes we just feel absolutely overloaded. So are there areas that both work at home and at, at work that we can actually do things better? And how can I go achieving this given what I deal with every day? So it's almost like time to take a step back while well, it's a great time. You know, it's coming towards the end of the year, the beginning of a new one, and it's a great time to really start thinking about what you do well and how you can do things better. So I like to add in a bit of lighthearted humor in very many of my speeches or my training or my webinars. And I mean, this is you at work. Like, for example, do you think to yourself, oh, my gosh, which is the way up? You know, is my life the way up or um, is, is upside down up to me? And it's really interesting, you know, what I was saying to a friend of mine the other day is I always seem to get more fatigued in October than any other month in the year. It's quite strange, and I don't know why, but if any month there is in the year, if you say to me, which is the month that you struggle most, I would say without a doubt October. And the way I feel October is exactly like this picture. Like I wake up sometimes thinking now, where am I going? What am I doing? You know, which organization am I working in today? Kind of everything just feels as if it's upside down. Or could this be you? Oh my gosh, I've got to get out of bed today and go yet again to that another crazy organization where I've got to go and, you know, kind of wade through a lot of nonsense in the day, bad hair day. And you just think to yourself, oh, yikes, do I have to do this again? Or, you know, is this you thinking, oh, there I go with my little handbag and my little hair you know, up in buns or up in plaits with my little earrings, do I have to go to work today? And I think when we've got the do I have to go to work today, it's stressful because one of the things I know from a lot of the researchers, probably you do as well, is that to go to work and love what you do is critical in our lives because if we don't love what we do and we spend so much of our lives at work, it becomes a very stressful situation. It's time to manage your stress and grow your resilience, ladies, and, and to look at, I mean, this woman is 93. Would you believe it? 93. Admittedly, she was a ballet dancer for most of her life, but if she can do that at 93, we can do that so many years younger. You know, do you wake up with that yes factor in the morning where you think, I'm so glad to be alive today. It's so wonderful to be able to go to my workplace because I love what I do and I love the people with whom I work you know, is it just, you wake up with the yes factor. And I think, you know, in our lives, who knows how long we will be around on this planet? Nobody knows, and that's a good thing. But I think it's about thinking about, yes, what can I do more of every day to have that yes factor in my life? So what is stress? Well, I think it's important because we hear people talk about stressed all the time. I'm stressed here, I'm stressed there. Organizations, I mean, stress, workplace stress costs organizations, and listen to this, this is scary, the Australian economy, $14.3 billion a year. 
Um, and I think it's the most scary, scary statistic. So when we talk about what stress is, it's the physical, mental, and emotional strain or tension about life. It could be an event, it could be a situation, or it could be just ongoing stress, which an example might be, for example, warfare. You know, warfare is chronic stress, we call it, or domestic violence, living in toxic relationships, or those relationships where we're stressed out every day. And the interesting thing about those relationships where we actually undergo chronic stress is that we get so used to living in chronic stress that we forget we're living in it. So we, our lives become this ongoing state of just never-ending stress, pressure, etc. But what we do know from the studies and the research is that there are three components of stress. One is personality and the personality with which we are born. The second is pressure and stress and our ability to manage it and cope with it. And the last factor of stress is coping mechanisms. So I'm going to talk about each of those really individually. But essentially what we do know is that stress is directly related to the way in which we feel pressure and our ability to to really deal with it. So if we quickly talk about personality types. We know that there are various personality types. So some of you might have done the Myers-Briggs personality types. And what that is, is that we talk about the extrovert and the introvert, and we talk about the scale about how we structure our world, which is the J and the P scale. So the reason why I'm raising that today is that the J scale Jays are people who are very structured, very orderly, very organized. They essentially live their lives according to lists, and they always have a plan, a plan to do things. And they often are people who, for example, if they go shopping, they are the people with the list as they walk around the shopping aisles, and they've got the pen, and they cross things off. Or if they're going on holiday, they've got a list of what they're going to take, what they're going to wear every day you know, how much money they need every day. They're very organized. They'll never get to the airport with no passport and they will never, for example, leave their children or forget their children at the shopping center. The other side of the scale are the P people and these the perceivings are people who are very much more laissez-faire, very much more relaxed in life. They go with the flow. They often ask uni students who will get their, you know, assessments in on the last minute. They might, you know, just cram everything into a suitcase and, yeah, I'm going on holiday and forget critical things. And they might get to the airport thinking, oh, my gosh, I forgot my, post, my passport. Now, it depends on where you sit on the spectrum. There's neither good, nor neither bad, neither right, neither wrong. But what we do know from the research is that the Js, i.e. the more structured, the more organized people, are people who tend to struggle with stress more. Why? Because they make lists and they are very planned because they want to be organized. And what we all know from life is that life isn't organized all the time. You know, life doesn't always go the way that we want it to go. So, you know, the plane is canceled or, you know, they, they forget something because they're unwell and so they're out of their kind of J flow. And so what we know is that often it's the Js who then stress more. So if you are a person who tends to be more organized or more planned, then you tend to be more stressed when things don't go your way. When we talk about pressure, we talk about, you know, life is happy when things are manageable and we feel as if we're in control. And that's all good. But what we know from life is that, you know, things kind of change and, you know, things happen and it's not what we always want it to be or what we think it will turn out to be. So, you know, as things gain in momentum, so you might have, let's say, that you're at work and you're feeling fine and then your boss gives you another three projects to do within the next month. So that's adding more pressure to you. And then, for example, you go home and you have a fight with your daughter who's rude to you. That's another pressure. The dog's sick and another pressure. And then your mum rings and she's unwell. So it's another thing that goes into the pressure cooker that's continuing to build, build, build. And then, you know, your husband comes home and he's just been retrenched and then you wake up with whooping cough or whatever it may be. So what you've got is a whole chain of life events that are sort of growing on top of each other and suddenly you feel overwhelmed. So the pressure cooker is now boiling at top, you know, level and the lid pops off and you just feel as if you're about to explode. So that's, that's really how we're talking about with regards to 
personality types and pressure. Now, the third being coping mechanisms is probably equally as important as the first two. And that is that what do we use to manage our stress well? What do we use to make sure that we're in control of life? And so there's a range of strategies in terms of coping mechanisms. So that could be, for example, regularly exercising, which is critical. I'll come back to that later on. A really good diet, eating you know, well, sleeping eight to nine hours a night, you know, watching your booze intake. Heaven for the sake, I'm not even going to mention smoking because that's just yucky poo. Uh, you know, things like um, really looking after yourself. So having your meditation, your yoga, your massage, all those kind of things. And what we know from the research is that the more coping mechanisms you use every day to reduce your stress and to keep your pressure under control, the more you are able to manage well. But if you don't use a range of coping mechanisms, and particularly the key ones which are sleep, exercise, and diet, then we know then that your ability to use different coping mechanisms is reduced. And so often what happens is that your pressure is increased and the pressure cooker really then just starts to boil over. And so stress increases and you're just feeling more and more uptight and overwhelmed. So we really need to think about this because as females, as women, you know, what we always know is that, I've, and I've been writing and talking and teaching and training this for so many, many years, is that women have a huge burden. And I don't mean burden disrespectfully, but we are doing so many things to the world. And the Dalai Lama said that the world will be led by the Western woman. And I think that's a really interesting concept because we do everything. So, you know, we more women now in the workforce than ever before we go to work. We have a full day. In the meantime, we're organizing for the children to get fetched from school or we leave work to get home, you know, to get home in time to fetch the children. And then it's the homework and then it's the cooking. On the weekends, it's the cleaning. And then it's looking after your ailing mum or your sick puppy or your friend who's getting divorced. And, you know, then you've still got to do things for the netball club because you're the president because your daughter plays. And, you know, then you've got to go, go home and cook that night because your in-laws are coming. You then you're the taxi driver and the bottle washer. You know all of these things. Even as I'm talking about these things and I'm naming all of these things, I feel exhausted by what we do as a gender. And there's no doubt in my mind that women are capable, essentially very capable to do everything. But I think if we don't look after ourselves and if we don't make ourselves the most important people in our lives, we are at risk of stress, overwhelm, and, you know, stress kills, heart attacks, strokes. I still believe cancer is largely induced by stress, whatever that may look like. So when we're talking about stress for women, which is obviously what I'm talking about today, it's not about maybe looking after yourselves, ladies. It's not about perhaps in the future getting into the exercise or maybe in 2021 I'm really going to learn how to do meditation and yoga. I'm talking about when you put the phone down or when you get off this webinar, you really start thinking about how you are living and what you are doing to keep your, your stress at bay because stress kills us. And as I said, the problem is women carry an enormous load and it's getting heavy and some of us feel like we're at breaking point all the time. I'll give you an example. A woman came to see me. Oh, well, I was running a training program in Tamworth and she had driven six and a half hours to see me. We start at nine and we end at four. So she must have got up at midnight to come through. And I said to her, this is insane. Why didn't you come through the night before? Because she was looking after children. And I just think, what? Well, that's just incredible. You know, so I think that, and so at at quarter past nine in the morning, she was sleeping on the table. And I said to her, you cannot do this. This is not good for your health. You need to try and get through today and listen to what I'm teaching you and then book into a hotel and stay and go to sleep at five o'clock at night. She was exhausted. And I think, you know, the other area that we really struggle with is those or are those of gender inequality. Leadership, I don't even have to tell all of you. You know what this looks like, ladies. So less than 1.9% of women are in international leadership positions. And if you look at that, and if I take it one step further, which is me being the cheeky me, well, that's because there's no real women barring the fantastic Jacinda Ardern, who's running a country certainly in the First World War, that has any sort of dominance or, or, or kind of impact on the world. So in leadership, what we know is that more men are in board positions and CEO positions by women, than women are. 
And that's a significant statistical difference. For example, if I'm sitting next to Johnny as a female and we, we've got the same qualifications or indeed even if he's got less, he still earns 17.3% more than I do. So, you know, when we talk about gender inequality, it's absolutely huge. And I'm not, I do not believe it's getting any better. And business overall, you know, as I said, and I, I do lots of, as you may know, empowering women programs. We go into organizations. We run workshops, et cetera. And wherever I go with my business cap on, the fact is that women don't have equal opportunities to those things that men do. And I was working with the chairman of a board the other day, and he says, well, you see, Karen, we've now got two more women in senior leadership positions. And I said, that's great. So what are you doing about developing them? And his comment to me was, well, you know, we're paying them $10,000 each extra year. And I said, well, that's not developing them. And his, he looked at me quizzically and said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, that's, that's tokenism. Where's that? So in many ways, I'm yet to be convinced that in organizations across the board, that we truly are working towards gender equality. Certainly some organizations are, but overall, I don't see it. Personal relationships, well, I could write books and libraries about this as well. And I always tell the story of a woman with whom I was working, and she came to see me because she was intent on leaving her husband. They'd been married for 30 years, very sad. But I remember saying to her, so, okay, what's your financial situation? So she said, well, what do you mean? I said, okay, so how much separation would you have or would your husband have? So she didn't have any because she was working in the home. Um, and she said, well, I don't know what my husband's got. And I said, okay, so what does your husband earn? She couldn't tell me. I said, okay, so why can't you tell me? She said, well, he's always just only given me a credit card every, you know, I live off the credit card and I buy the basics. I've got $250 a week to spend and then he'll pay the credit card off at the end of the month. And I say, okay, so how much does he earn? She didn't know that either. So she doesn't know what he earns. She doesn't know what his superannuation is. She doesn't know. She, she says, I say, well, what property do you have? Well, we own this house. And it was quite weird. I don't know why. I thought, no, I don't believe that. There's something here that that's not right. So I introduced her to something called forensic accounting, where no matter what they do or we do or anybody does, you cannot hide how much money you've got. So what they did was they found the money. And guess what, ladies? He had, tw no, with this particular property, um, he had 12 in total. So he had 11 other properties. 11 other properties that had been paid off around the world. So one in London, two in Nice, two in Lebanon. Uh, and I mean, when we talk about equality in relationships, well, yeah, I think that says it all. In families and communities, I mean, there's very many communities that are still patriarchal, very many around the world. And there's still some countries, as you know, where women have either just recently got the vote or still don't have the vote. So, you know, let's not get me started on that topic because I just get frustrated. And of course, in the, you know, the A-list industries, the movie industries, came, comes out of the Weinstein thing and it's continuing to go on, you know, and essentially it's around the, essentially like around the sexual and financial domination of women, which has led to the rise of the Me Too movement. And these are all stressful things for females, you know, being being the second runner in the home or the marriage, you know, not being treated or paid the same if you're a movie person, you know, or in business not being afforded the same opportunities, not being given the, the chances to be leaders. It's stressful. And what we know from the research, which is equally as interesting, is that women make better leaders overall because we are emotional and what we do need to do is to learn to be more emotionally intelligent, absolutely. But in that comes our compassion and ultimately it makes us better leaders. So, you know, when we talk about inequality, yeah. When our roles exhaust us, and I'm not talking just about our roles at work, I'm talking about our roles at home, I'm talking about our roles in the community. When our roles exhaust us, let's just say at work, it's just all too much. And many women work in chaotic organizations, chaotic systems, chaotic government departments. And this is not a, a criticism of that. It's just, you know, there's so much happening and so much backlog and so much, I think, lack of planning, last minute firefighting, that eventually our roles just exhaust us. And when our roles exhaust us and your roles are busy and very active, often running from one engagement to the other, often dealing with difficult people all the time, it's exhausting. And so then I think what we're doing is ultimately trying to catch our tail all the time. We drag ourselves out of bed in the morning 
and we try and put as much, you know, zip in our step as we can throughout the day, although most of us walk around looking like the walking dead or feeling like the walking dead if we don't look like it. And then we drag ourselves home and we put the meaning, the, mo- the evening meal together and then we drag ourselves into bed and we exhaust it. Many of us are exhausted. The problem is I think we take on too much. Um, so many of us, are, we're just plain exhausted. We spend much of our time looking after others and forget ourselves in the process. And many of us, because we haven't learned to say no effectively, we just take on more and more at work. And because there's little time for us in our lives, we feel stressed, overwhelmed, and over it. And one of the things I'd like you to write down right now is I am the most important person in my life. And I want you to start really thinking about that and taking yourself seriously. And what I want you to do, and this is going to be very much foreign to most of you, is get selfish about who you are, about the time you spend on yourself. If you see a really nice shirt that you would never dare to spend $150 on, I want you to say, you know what, I am valuable enough. I'm important enough. I'm going to buy that for myself and I'm going to relish it. Even if the family has to eat corned beef for the next week, buy yourself that lipstick, buy yourself that shirt or those shoes because you deserve it. And when you stress and exhaust all the time and then what happens is you don't enjoy your work anymore. Our relationships struggle. We struggle with ourselves. We lose our mojo and life becomes a chore. And when your life is a chore, there's no fun in that anymore. And largely overall, it's because we have not put ourselves first, ladies. So we take on too much. So I want you to realistically look at all aspects of your life. Where do you work? Where do you live? Like, for example, do you work six hours from where you live or four hours or two hours? If if you're living two hours from where you're working, it's too far because you're driving four hours a day. And it just puts stress on you. It puts additional stress on your life and you don't need to have that stress. Where does your life take on too much? So are you doing too much whereby you actually put yourself last, as I said just now, and ultimately you become the last person in your life? If you are the last person in your life, trust me, it's just going to be added stress. And, you know, even regardless of how resilient you want to become, it's too hard when you've got too many things on your plate. And I think we all need to think about that as women. And you ask yourself, how does this all happen? What's happened to my life that I feel so stressed? I'll tell you what happens. It happens over time, slowly. And I think sometimes it's very insidious. What that means is that we don't even know that we're taking on more and more and more until that pressure cooker is so full that we cannot get one more thing into that pressure cooker. And we fall apart sick anxious, going on antidepressant or anxiety pills because we've we've overloaded. So I want you to think now when you get off this webinar, what do you need to cut out? What can you delegate? How are you going to do that? Who are you going to delegate to? Your children, your husbands, your friends, you know, your, your community, the people at work. Just cut back what you're taking on. And for things to change, first, I must change, ladies. Things will not change unless you change. And the other thing is, we want to change, but don't really move to change. We dream of things being different. We want a new life with more excitement and less stress. And we promise ourselves, yep, this is going to happen. But we don't make the changes. We think about Monday, I'm going to start the Ghana Club, I call them. Yep, I'm going to start. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to work less. I'm going to look after myself more. I'm going to delegate more stuff to my staff, the Ghana Club. And what I find difficult about the Ghana Club is that if you're doing the Ghana Club, then you're not doing the doing club. And the Ghana Club is never going to make it. We think about how things will change when we retire or we have more time or we get more leave or we earn more money. Well, for some of you, retirement might be 30 years away. And now if you've got two kids and you're working full time and you're at home doing what you can, when are you going to have more time? You're never going to have more time unless you make more time. We get more leave. Well, you know what? Take long service if you can or take leave in lieu of or 
even if you take leave in the future, take it if you want to go and do something that you've really wanted to all your life. Don't wait because you might not be here tomorrow or you're going to wait until you have more money. And I'm not teaching you not to be good money managers, but you know what? Give an example. My son is studying at Singapore, and he finishes on the 9th of, November, of December, sorry. And he wants to come home. He's enjoyed it, but I think he's over it. And I thought to myself, well, that's fantastic. He's going to come back, and I'll really love that, which I will. And I thought, you know, I work too hard myself, and I thought, that's it. I'm going to go to Vietnam. I'm going to go to Singapore, and I'm going to get him, and we're going to go to Vietnam and Cambodia for a 10- or 12-day holiday. And that's something I would never have done 10 years ago, never. I've got to stay at work. I've got to make sure everybody's fine at work and look after things well. Quite frankly, everybody's quite able to look after themselves, and the business will keep going, and I will just go and have a little holiday with my son, who's 22, and I'll probably never have the opportunity to do that again in my whole life. So earn more money, it doesn't matter, I'll just stick it on the credit card and I'll pay it off when I need to, as it is, because I might never get the chance again. So when we don't make the change, what happens is, I'll tell you what happens is, often by the time we manage our stress and take leave, we're too exhausted to enjoy it. We get sick as our bodies have had enough. We don't get to enjoy ourselves for many reasons. Just coming back to that, Have you ever noticed that if you go on holiday and you take leave, how you get sick? So you might get whooping cough or you might get a cold or you might get migraines or your body aches or you get, you know, um, stomach aches or whatever. And I often believe that it's because we're so busy, 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 that when we do give our bodies the time to relax, it it sort of has got all that pent up sickness in it or whatever it might be, exhaustion, that it just relaxes and we get sick. And there's notoriously in schools, if school holidays, kids are sick, teachers are sick, parents are sick because the, teacher, because the children are sick, and so it goes on. And I really think that there's something in that. And so, you know, when you're on holiday and you're sick, you can't enjoy it as much. Lots to think about. So some of the solutions to problem two, we'd want change but don't make the effort. I think it's time that you learned about stress and how it actually impacts you as an individual because stress impacts us differently. You are the person who has control over how you respond to life, nobody else, and you've got actually no control over anybody else anyway. The only person over whom you have control is you. So what are you doing about that? Get a handle on the triggers that you have. Triggers are the things that get you really going And you know that you're going to have an emotional reaction to them. So for me, as I think I might have explained in the past, it's animal cruelty. If I see animal cruelty, I just get instantly angry. And I saw this advertisement or this, it was an advertisement on television the other day about this huge caged bear. So this bear was in a cage that it could hardly sit in. And I felt that absolute anger arise in me. You know, I find it very stressful to see things like that. It makes me very upset. And so there was nothing I could do about that barring donate. So I'm donating. And I think that those are the things that we need to understand. What are the things that are going to make us stressed always so that we've got some way that we can deal with those things so that we can control the stress that they engender in us? And that was the way that I could do it. It doesn't make me any less angry, but at least I feel I've got some control over what I'm doing about it. Practice the skills that you have around managing stress. Now, I often say this, you know, when we talk about mantras, and I often use the example of me being on a plane. Now, I fly all the time, as you know, most of you would know. I'm flying in Australia domestically, but I'm flying more internationally than I fly domestically, and I absolutely hate it. I've never enjoyed flying. I never will enjoy flying. I've been to the Fearless Flyers course. It has helped because it's taught me that a wing can never fall off. That's good. If you didn't know that, ladies, a wing cannot fall off. Um, But overall... Going up, I'm fine. Coming down, I'm fine. But it's up there. I'm just nervous and anxious all the time. And it's always around turbulence. And my mantra is calm, Karen, stay calm. Calm, Karen, stay calm. Calm, Karen, stay calm. So I try and talk myself calm because I know that the turbulence is a trigger that's going to get me going. So I've learned these strategies and things that I can use in the future to try and remain calm. But there's some things that I find very difficult to remain calm. So how does the woman who manages her stress 
well live? What does she do? Well, firstly, she's in touch with how she feels about things. So, you know, very often we're taught to think about how we think about things, but we're not taught to get in touch with how we feel about things. And I think very often we stressed emotionally for all the reasons that I've described this morning. It's about how do you feel about things that are going on in your life? She's also able to work out where her stress comes from. I think that's a really important point. So I was coaching somebody the other day, a really lovely female. She's a CEO. I say to her, where does your stress come from? And she says, I don't really know. I said, okay, so what are the things in your job that make you stressful? Well, I'm not really sure. Okay, so I had to actually break it down for her to, so that she could understand where the things are that makes her stress. So, for example, things like, um, when reports aren't in on time or when the funding application is missed. But what I'm saying or what I'm actually showing you is that she wasn't really sure of where her stress comes from because she's not in touch with it. She, she just sees it as this big kind of melting pot of stress. But I think often if you're able to understand where your stress comes from and then put in place strategies to deal with that, then we find that we can actually manage our stress quite well or better. The woman who manages the stress well doesn't sweat the small stuff. And I, you know, I must say that that's something that I've learned as I've got older or more mature. I was very sort of stressy. I think essentially I'm probably more of a, a J stressy person. And that's why I run a lot because I find that keeps my stressy stuff happening going down. Um, and I've learned not to stress the small stuff. So if your hair doesn't look good today, it really doesn't matter. Or, you know, if you forgot to put the dinner on and you're 15 minutes late in the grand scheme of life, it doesn't matter. It's the big things that's, that we need to worry about, not the small stuff. And I think we spend so much time worrying about the small stuff. The woman who manages her stress well says, look, I'd love to do it, can't, don't have the time, I apologize, find somebody else. And she doesn't feel bad about it. She doesn't walk away thinking, oh, I feel so bad, I feel so guilty. There's no guilt in saying no, but I think we don't do this well. We struggle with this. She doesn't take on too much. She's able to say, can't do it this week, might be able to do it in a month, but I can't do it right now. If you'd like me to do it in a month, I will, but right now I can't do it. And she doesn't feel bad about that. In other words, she's got realistic expectations of herself and others. She knows that we can only do one thing at a time. And I always tell the story about my three children. So years ago, when my, when my youngest child was about two, he wanted me to, put his, to help him with his shoelaces. So as I'm bending down, teaching him how to do the shoelaces, which was probably a bit too soon at two, my other child's screaming at me for help with the toilet. So he's three and on the toilet and needs help. And my daughter, who's five at the time, is in the kitchen asking me about breakfast and making a noise and wants me to help her. And I remember this absolute incident so clearly because I remember the first thing was I just thought, oh, my gosh, I feel so overwhelmed. Will all of these people stop demanding of me? Can you all leave me alone? I just want peace and quiet. And it was a turning time for me because I remember in that moment doing his shoelaces thinking, right, settle. Just settle, Karen. Right. One thing at a time. So I said to all of them, I can only do one thing at a time. I will be with you when I've got the time. I'm doing Matthew's shoes. So I remember finishing his shoelaces, did that. Then I said, right, Matt, you fine? Yes, mum. Right. Then I'm off to the toilet. So I go off to the toilet where Nicky is. I help him on the loo. Right. Done that. Wash my hands. Good. Move to the kitchen. And I, it, it was a changing time for me because it, somehow it was this sort of aha moment when I realized I can only do one thing at a time. And so I prioritize my work according to that. I've got the most important and the things that have to be done first at the top. And I have, I'm really big on lists and diaries, so I make a list of everything I've got to do that week. And if I don't finish something that week, then I do it the next week. I've got realistic expectations of myself because the less I have high, high, high expectations, the more I feel comfortable. And I'm, you know, able to see that in other people as well. But I do put myself first. Um, some people might regard that as selfish, and I'm sorry they do because particularly women, you need to learn to put yourself first too. If I want to go to a movie on my own, I'll go on my own. If I want to go away for a weekend because I need time out, I go. Because what I've realized 
is that I am the most important person in my life. Without me, I don't have a life, right? But more importantly, if I don't have a life and I'm not good, then my children aren't good. And if my children aren't good, then their world is not good. If I'm not good, then my, let's say, ailing mum or my ailing dad aren't good because I'm not good. And, you know, the thing is, I want you to think about that in many ways, women are the center, the nucleus of everybody around them's world. And if we're not good in our world, then neither are they. And that's really important to think about. So there's eight eight ways to manage stress. And I think this is the most important. If you don't focus on your health, ladies, on your mental, physical, spiritual and emotional health, well, who will look after it for you? You know, and that comes back to putting yourself first. Your health is absolutely everything. And so one of the key things we know is that exercise is critical, three to four times a week, 30 to 40 minutes a time, but not a stroll down to the corner cafe for a latte. You know, the cardiovascular beating, boom, boom, boom. Getting fit, getting healthy, getting off your bottom and being active. Because the more active you are and the fitter you are, the more endorphins are released, the greater your mood, the more optimistic you are, the lower your weight, the less the blood pressure, the more you're able to move around, the less depression, the less anxiety. I don't have to go on. You know all of this. And yet, if there's 20 or 30 of you on the line right now, which there are, if there, let's say there's 30 of you, maybe four of us, including myself, are regular exercisers. And why is that? Oh, I don't have the time. Too busy don't have the the inclination. Well, I think it's an important thing to think about. It's not about whether you want to or whether you like to. It's what you need to do. And if you don't like running or the gym, well, go walking and go swimming. But do something. The other thing, for example, is food. Watch your diet. Oh, my gosh, I see Australians, and myself included at times, eat absolute garbage. Junk foods, fatty foods, chips hot potatoes, Cokes, lemonades. It's all garbage. It's not going to do anything for us. So stick rather with the natural juices. Stick with the really good foods, you know, the veggies, the fruit, all the things that are good for us. I'm not saying don't have a Macca's occasionally, but occasionally. My 82-year-old grandmother, before she passed, said something to me, which I always say. Your health is all. Without your health, All is nothing. You will have nothing. You won't have a life if you don't have your health. So if you don't have your health, start thinking about how am I going to look after it and much better. Exercise three to four times a week, 30 to 40 minutes a time. Have a healthy diet. Surround yourself with positive, optimistic people. There's nothing better than being with somebody who has that yes factor in life. Oh, I love life. It's so fantastic as opposed to the person who's negative. I hate my husband, I hate my wife, I hate my children, I want to sell my son on eBay, hate the dogs, want to sell the cat, want to get rid of my neighbor. Oh my gosh, those people, I tell you what, wound your soul. Walk away from them. Think about how you're going to get friends who are more optimistic and positive. And if you're married to somebody who's always negative and hates life, well, think again, ladies. I'm not telling you what to do. All I'm saying is think again. Watch those things that stress you. Build your confidence in any way you can. Learn to communicate assertively and confidently. And so when we talk about that, have your needs met. If you're in a meeting, if you have something to say, say that something. Don't walk away from that meeting thinking, oh, my God, I wish I'd said something, but I don't have the confidence. Like build up the confidence, believe in yourself, back yourself, and sleep at least eight hours a day if you can. People often say, You know, the worst thing to do is to not eat food or to starve yourself. You will live longer not drinking water. You will live longer starving yourself than you will on two things. First is oxygen and the second is sleep. Sleep deprivation was used as a method of torture in the Second World War. You can't last long without sleep. You will just shut your eyes and die. So if your sleep is not good, you need to get that sorted because it's going to add to your stress. Nurture yourself. Enjoy yourself. Have fun. You know, enjoy your life because unless you believe in reincarnation, ladies, this is the only shot at it you have. The second topic that really buys into stress is resilience. Now, when I when I actually chose this photograph, that you you know see this huge tornado, 
and all of these people living in the states that have these tornadoes hurtling down towards them sometimes. I'm petrified by these things, seriously petrified, because look at the power in that. And yet you see the most amazing resilience in these people who can survive these freaks of nature. I have a brother living in Christchurch, and I went to see him a couple of years ago, and I remember getting off the plane, and I had this low-lying anxiety, and I couldn't work out what it was. And then I was with him for about a week, and one morning we had a 4.3 on the Richter scale, and it was a small shake, and I just got this huge anxiety. And then I realized why I was anxious all the time. I'm anxious around these sort of things, earthquakes, flying, you know, tsunamis, all these sort of things. And I couldn't wait to leave Christchurch. I really couldn't because it's on that weak link that goes up, you know, New Zealand, Japan, San Francisco, et cetera, et cetera. But I think, you know, there's so much research that's done into resilience and the ability to bounce forward. And, and what is this thing called resilience? And what are the characteristics of resilience? And what we know from a lot of the studies is that those people who have a purpose tend to be more resilient. So in New Zealand, their purpose is to rebuild their communities and continue to have a great life in Christchurch. Although I say, why would you do that? Because it's fabulous to have a purpose, but you, your purpose is going against what Mother Nature does. And we human beings think that we are absolutely in control of our lives and nature. We're not. If the tsunami is going to hit, it's going to hit. If an earthquake is going to come, it's going to come, as is the twister. So, but what we do know is if those communities that have a purpose to rebuild, have a purpose to be inclusive and make sure everybody else in the community is well, then they, they generally tend to be more resilient. They persevere. Resilient people keep going no matter what. You know, they might hit the most amazing obstacles in their lives, but they keep going. And I always ask this question, how many times do you think Abraham Lincoln, the president of the United States, tried before he got there? He was a very depressed man, by the way. He also had a sweetheart, a childhood sweetheart to whom he was engaged, who died whilst he was trying. He was actually a really sad man, although he was so resilient. Guess, no, I've got someone saying 11, no, not 8, no. 19 times. On the 19th time, he became president of the United States of America. I mean, that is what you call keeping going no matter what. Stay balanced, ladies. And this is what we talk about. Those people have a balanced life. So work is only one part of your life. It's not your whole life. So what we talk about is the ability to have fun, good social relationships around us, good connections with other human beings. We need that because we are social animals. Balance is also about being able to go out and have friendships. It's also about being having quiet times. So religion, meditation, yoga, you know, all of those sort of things. Pilates, sitting on the beach, looking at nature. It's also around looking after our bodies and making sure we're healthy. And that's how we stay balanced. Believe in you and become self-reliant. You are capable of so many things and you are able to do exactly what you want to with your life. And particularly, as I said throughout this entire webinar, as women, we do life well, but we do too much. And I think part of that is actually something that keeps us in the danger zone around stress and the inability to manage and feeling that we're just overwhelmed. And to be comfortable with who you are, warts and all. No matter what you do, no matter who you are, you are you. Naturally change those things about you that you don't like, but ultimately, you're a wonderful woman and you have heaps about which to be proud and learn key skills to be resilient, you know, to think resiliently. Some of the research, which I think is really interesting by the likes of Daniel Goleman, who's the king of emotional intelligence. He's done a lot of research around emotional intelligence. And he talks about the fact that thinking, to think resiliently is critical if we are going to act in a resilient way, to think positively. I can, not I cannot. No matter what happens, um, you know, breaking through is possible. Nothing's impossible. It's in the way you think. If you think you can't deal with people who treat you badly, well, you won't be able to deal with them. If you think you believe you're not good enough for a particular role, well, then you won't be because you said yourself you're not. If you continue to doubt yourself, well, you'll just keep doubting it. And you, if you don't take control of your life, that's okay because others will. And that also relates to your careers, by the way. I always say don't leave your careers to other people. 
if you have identified you want to be, I don't know, an engineer in a small engineering company, for example, as a female, then you make sure that you take the steps to get there to become that engineer. Don't let other people control your career. So it's about knowing where you want to go and taking steps to get there and to think in, re in resilient ways. The age-old thing is, I say this time and time again, how can I recover? Challenge your life scripts, particularly if negative. So those are things like when you say to yourself, I'll never be smart enough to do that job, or I'll never be thin enough to get you know, into that dress, or nobody's going to really want me, I don't have the skills. All of those are what we call negative life skills. Often negative or life skills generally are learned when we're little, so from naught to seven. We're not born with life skills. We are taught those. Those are part of nurture. So we can change them, which is fantastic as long as we understand what they are. And to think optimistically about life and all the challenges that you face. There's nothing generally you cannot overcome. Think can do, not cannot do. And constantly ask yourself, how can I recover? So if you haven't got the job promotion you want, how can I recover? If your marriage falls apart and you feel devastated, how can I recover? If you lose a friendship because you've been cranky and impatient, how can I recover? If you crash your car and you need to fix it, how can I recover? It doesn't really matter what life situation you find yourself in. The question is four words. How can I recover? Because generally you can. So six strategies to building resilience, obviously, is to look after your health, as I've said so many times today. Look for solutions to problems when things go wrong. What I always say, particularly to women, is don't roll over and not look for solutions. I mean, some things you cannot find solutions to maybe the big ticket items. You know, um, your husband's left you for a woman, whatever, who's younger than you. And no matter what you do, you can't solve that particular problem. But what you can do is you can become the best version of yourself that you can be. Surround yourself with positive people and make sure your relationships are solid. And love your life. Go out there and shine and thrive and do new things and meet new people. And undoubtedly, you'll meet a new partner because you deserve it. Check your self-talk. I can't do this. I can't do that. Yes, you can. To yes, I can and yes, I will. From negative to positive. Live the balanced life. The mental, physical, social and spiritual life. Those four quadrants of your life. Make sure you're balanced. So you're not spending all of your life working so hard. Have clearly defined goals. In five years, so you've got short, medium, and long-term goals. Short might be in six months, five years might be middle-term, medium-term, and 10 years is longer-term. So what do you want to do in the short-term? I want to lose 10Ks. What do I want to do in the medium-term? I want to buy a car. What do I want to do in the long-term? I want to buy a house. Write your goals down. Make sure they meet the SMART goal principles, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. We know from the research the people who actually write their goals down and follow their action plans tend to achieve them. And they then tend to be people who are wealthier, healthier, live longer, have better relationships and make more money. And that's what the research says. Learn good time management skills so you do things on time. Getting things in late or you know, missing deadlines can be very scary and very stressful for some of us. So plan your workout well and in time. Be optimistic, as I said earlier. Managing your stress well moves you from this to this. And so it's about thinking about how you are in your life, how to manage stress, how to deal with your resilience, and think, how can I recover? So are there any questions that any of you would like? I'm happy to take one or two right now. Okay, so this particular question was from Jane. So Jane's asking me about... Um, working in the teaching industry and how stressful it is because I think it is stressful and what you do when the system doesn't necessarily prop you up. And I think it's a really good question, Jane. So what I'm saying is you cannot control anything that's not in your control. You know, if you're working in a, in, in a department of education or if you're working in a department of finance or if you're working in a huge organization, you can't change things that you can't change. The only thing you can do is learn to manage yourself very, very well and to reduce as much stress as you can reduce and be as resilient as you can in your own area because you have control over nothing else. So what I would be doing is looking at the way that I work. I'd be looking at how I prioritize my work. 
I'd be looking at how I manage my time. So are there ways that I can work more efficiently and more effectively? Are there ways that I can, you know, stagger my workload throughout the day so I don't feel overwhelmed and stressed and pressured? Should I take more downtime, more regularly, so that I feel more energized and more able? Should I, you know, do more delegating? Should I extend time frames that I've got so that I can do it all in the time frame as opposed to panicking and feeling overwhelmed that I've got so much to do but not enough time in which to do it? So those are the things I would do, Jane, and I would be able to sort of, you know, do put write down some goals around this and look at how you're going. Are you achieving those goals? Are you not achieving those goals? How can you do it better, more of, et cetera? So, yeah, and, I, you know, I think it's about just taking that step back, all of us as women and as human beings, and thinking about what we can do more in our lives so that we're less stressed. So, yeah, not easy, certainly not suggesting it is, but you can all do it. Well, thank you so much, ladies. As usual, as always, I've loved being with you, and I really look forward to speaking to you in the future and working with you as well. So blessings to you all, and I will see you hopefully soon. Take care. Bye.